In terms of light, what we are covering today is lenses. Last week we talked about um, refraction and a little bit about mirrors. This is going to be a little different than mirrors. So what we're looking at is lenses. And what happens with lenses is when light goes through them, so these don't reflect, these transmit, and they bend light. So there's refraction going on. So to give you a bigger example of uh, one example of a lens, um, this is basically a cell that's actually filled with a form of gel. And it used to be used as a magnifier back in the day before um, they had everything digitally where you could just zoom in. This would be like a magnifier that would be put over a map or an image where they could zoom in. Now it doesn't, it's not really useful in terms of that anymore. So it's more useful in terms of just sticking in front of your face and um, looking at yourself through it. It's not as interesting. I'm going to take off my mask for a second. So this is going to shield me. So it's a little more interesting without a mask. Well, if I, if you look at yourself through here, um, you can get some actual distortion to your face like that. So those of you at home, I'll bring this up really close to the camera. <laughs> So there's some distortion there. And again, this is refraction that when light enters a different medium, it gets bent. And that causes its shape to change, or what we see gets distorted. Now, there's two different types of lenses that we're going to look at. And The first type is a convex or converging lens. So a convex lens is, the key to this is that in the center, it has a greater thickness than at the edge. So it basically shaves out. Now all these lenses in our diagrams, because there's no true back of the lens, technically they have focal points on either side. Now, the next slide here isn't really in your um, drawings, or I should say, the next slide here isn't in the paper ones if you're doing the paper notes, but really I just zoomed in on the top here. And the idea behind this, anytime light enters that new medium. The thing to remember is there's that normal that perpendicular to the surface. That's not a great perpendicular one. Let me see. Let me do a little bit better. That's a little bit better. Let me just move this. So if light is traveling from air into a solid, it's going to slow down. So the idea is that rather than continuing on that straight line, the light gets back like this. And again, this is air. And this is either glass or some type of plastic, but just for this, I'll call it glass. So we have index one here of refraction, index two here. Because that index is greater than that, angle one here is going to be greater than angle two as well. So the idea here is that when light enters that new medium, it gets bent. And that's what's causing that deformation or that difference in what you see when you look through your lens. We'll look at it a bigger picture to understand what images look like, but it's actually going to get bent again. So when the light eventually hits that surface on the other side, if I draw another perpendicular to the surface here, Well, that's not the best perpendicular, but let's pretend it's this big. 
It's moving from glass again. Moving from glass to air. We're again, we're going from N2 to N1 here. So it's actually going back. So again, oh shoot, I drew this now. Sorry about that. I made a mistake there. Um, undo that erase there. I drew the greater than or less than sign opposite here. Angle one should be greater than one for this. Apologies for that. So again, this angle there inside of the glass is small. So when we look at this angle here, let me give that another number. Let's call it angle three. So when it moves to air, Again, what's happening to the speed when it changes medium, it's speeding up. So when it comes out of the other side, it's going to end up going faster. So rather than traveling along a straight path, So rather than traveling along that straight path, it's going to bend even more. Now, you're not going to be asked to draw angles like that. The big thing is for you to understand if you're given a picture like this, um, which angle we expect to be or how you would expect it to bend. So again, when it slows, It bends towards the normal. And again, the normal is that perpendicular. And when it gets faster, like in this case, it bends away. So usually we don't show, and we'll take a look on the next slide. We usually don't show what's happening inside of here. We usually don't show that in all of our diagrams for the rest of the day. We're going to ignore what's going to happen inside the lens and just show what happens when it comes out the other side. And there's a couple of different rules of what happens when it goes from one side to another. So. For a converging lens, if you played around with any of those uh, lens shapes on Friday, with the, if you were in person, played around with those different um, shapes in that light box, what you would see is that for a convex or converging lens, light that comes in parallel, parallel rays. of light that enter the lens. On the other side, they all pass through the focal point. So all these rays that are coming in are coming in parallel with each other. And those are all bent by the glass So again, we're not really showing those double bendings that are happening. Just the general rule to determine the path that'll take is that it's going to travel through the full plane. Sometimes what if you're ever asked to make a ray drawing of this on a test, for example, what we would usually do is draw the incoming ray until we get about halfway through and then bend it. So essentially what if I was drawing a new ray of light, 
find one that was coming in perpendicular or sorry parallel I would show that it bends through the focal point That's one rule of how the light is bent through a convex lens. Now, this type of lens, you've probably seen if you've ever played with magnifying glasses before, this is a convex lens. So, this magnifying glass here is a convex because it curves out. So, taking a magnifying glass out into the sun, and we might do this if it's a sunny day after the AP exam, we could do something like this. but You've never taken a magnifying glass out into the sun. The idea is that if you shine the sun through it, you can actually get a bright spot or a focal point where all that light energy can be concentrated. So if you really want, you could burn a piece of paper or burn a leaf, or if you're um, a little more cruel, you could burn some ants. Um, you know, they're ants. They step on them all the time. But you could also burn your hand if you really felt like you wanted to go viral and just burn your hand on YouTube and go out or on TikTok or whatever your social media platform is. For. So this point where the light concentrates is a focal point because essentially what's happening is any light rays that are coming in parallel are all concentrating on that point. Because light, he said, is a wave, so it's really a form of energy. So when you concentrate all that energy in one point, you have enough to actually burn something or increase it. Now, the other flip side to this, we're not going to go into the lens to show how this works, but if light You had a source of light at the focal length. Because again, in a lens, you can look through either side. There's no front or back of the lens. But if you have a light source at the focal lens, focal point, rays of light that are coming from that focal point, when they come out to the other side, they'll be parallel. So any ray of light that seems to emanate from the focal point is bent. So again, what's happening in here in the lens, light is being bent. And when it comes out the other side, it'll be parallel. Now we'll talk about what this means in terms of image formation in a little bit. And then tomorrow, you'll look at either a simulation or a hands-on lab where you actually see what the images actually do look like. So applying those two rules to image formation. So if you have an object behind the focal length, so this is our object. Now, what we're trying to do is triangulate where Actually, not really trying to really go into two lines. There are three potential lines we could draw, but if we follow any two of those and see where they meet, we can determine where an image will be formed. So this first line here, a light beam that comes from the object parallel. And again, this light source is giving off millions of rays of light. We could follow any of those and find where it met with another one. But there are three really easy ones to follow. And if we follow any two of those and see where they meet, we could determine where an image will be. So the first one, rays of light that go in parallel are bent so that on the other side, it goes through the focal point. The other ray of light we can trace, which is even simpler, if it goes through the center of the lens, it gets bent and then unbent. So it just goes straight through. So 
light that goes straight through the center of the lens gets bent on one side and unbent on the other. So it actually looks like it goes straight through. When those two meet, that is where we can say the image is formed. So we are tracing this from the top here. So that's where the top would be. And again, this would be the image. Now, the third possible line I could draw. Uh, So the other one we talked about is light that goes through the focal point on this side. So if it emanated through the focal point on the other side, it would go flat. Now this doesn't line up perfectly because I didn't make my drawing great, right. but that third possible line goes through the focal point and then it comes out parallel. So basically that first and third rays are exact opposite of each other. So again, you don't need to draw all three of those. Just two of them will suffice. And like I said, that center one, that red one is super easy to draw. Now, a couple of points about this image. So if the object is behind the focal point, the image is going to be real. Because actual rays of light meet, and this could be projected on a screen. Now, when we used to have a projector in here, what was happening is the image in the, or the, what was on the screen in the projector, or the image in the projector was being projected onto a screen. And we actually had a real image projected on the wall. Now we have this monitor. We've lost a little bit of um, lens physics or optical physics, but the image would be real. We'll take a look at that tomorrow. Another thing about it, it is inverted. And for all of our images, whether it be lenses or mirrors, these two always go together. A real image will always be inverted. Now, whether it's magnified or reduced depends on how far away you are from there. So magnified or reduced really depends on your distance, how far back you are from the focal point. So we can't just assume if it's going to be magnified or reduced. Now, one thing that's going to be true, um, let me add a little bit of a dot here. So we talked about something called the radius of curvature, sometimes called C or R. That's two times the focal length. If the object is behind there, there's a general rule that says it'll be reduced. And if it's in front, it'd be magnified. You can always solve this with the calculation. And if it's exactly on that point, it's going to be the same size. So for some reason you're taking the AP test and need to remember that. I'll go over it again during our review. And we'll talk about the calculations that'll help you figure it out. But that's just kind of a general rule. So that's a lot to go over for this example. So the other case would be if it's in front of the focal point. So that first line, well, I'm going to draw the second one first, just because that's the easier one. So this second one's the same one from before. If it goes to the center, so it's from the object here, going right through the center, it doesn't get bent. 
it gets bent and then unbent. So it just goes straight through. Now, this other ring of light, this is the one we call the first one and the last one. It starts out parallel, and then it gets curved or bent. I'm going to call it bent. Through. Now, what you'll see is that these two rays of light never meet. So that means we are not making a real image. In order for us to have a real image, in other words, to be projected on something, like a projector can project an image on a wall. Those rays of light actually have to touch somewhere in the real world. So since this doesn't occur, when you look through this lens with your eye, so your eyes looking this way. Actually, let me move the eyes out here. So and when your eye is looking that way, those rays of light that never meet come into your eye. And your eye imagines where it looks like they are coming from. So it follows both of those rays back through the lens and even behind the actual light bulb where it looks like it seems they're coming from. So where it looks like it seems they're coming from is actually further back than the actual object. So the right light rays never meet and your eye is trying to make sense of it. So it sees a virtual image. It creates its own sense of where the heck these light rays come from. So when you look at my face through this um, gel lens here, it's not that light is coming from my face through here and actually meeting on the back of your retina, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Your eyes trying to try to make sense of how this light is being bent and the fact that it's never meeting. And it sees a virtual image. But when you look at me, I'm still upright. But I am very, very amazed at that. So when my face, when I hold my face close to here, the idea is my face is closer than the focal length. Focal length is probably somewhere back out here. So if I held my face far enough and I had a bright enough object, I could probably project it on a wall. But when you have the object really close to the lens, it'll look like that. The most common example of this is a magnifying glass. And that's why when you have a magnifying glass, you're holding it pretty close to whatever you're looking at. So the object you're looking at just holds the lens closer, and that's why you're able to see it magnified. So that's for the convex mirror. I'm sorry, convex lens. The other type of lens is one that spreads up. So convex converges, concave spreads out light. So in this example, again, we could go through how it's bent on each point, but that's not the important part. The important part is that rays of light that come in parallel here, are spread out in different directions. So diverging essentially means it spreads. So this center here, when it says it's thicker near the end, 
That means in the center, it's thinner than it is at the end. So it curves. So parallel rays are spread out. Now, the way they are spread out. They are spread out in line with that focal point there. So they seem to be coming from that focal point. And that's how you figure out the angle they spread out at. So this one, and again, I don't know how great I did at drawing these. Apparently not too great. But the idea is they should appear to be spreading out from a single point. And that's the whole point. That's how you determine how they're getting bent. So it's not just being bent at a random angle. It's in line with that focal point back there. And again, we'll apply these when we look at how they make images. So the opposite of that is also true. If we have light that seems to be trying to get to the focal point, the light that's aimed towards the focal point is going to be bent parallel. So incoming light that looks like it was headed towards the focal point that would normally head to the focal point. When it hits that lens, it gets bent. Now what this allows for, if your eye was over here and you were looking through that lens, Let's say you're looking that way through the lens. Rather than just seeing what's over here, you can actually see more of the world than you normally would. It pulls in from a wider angle than you normally would be able to see. So with this lens, you can actually see more than you usually would. But we'll talk about the fact that everything is going to be a lot smaller than it usually is. Now, there's only one drawing for this one, one paper. So it doesn't matter where the object is. It doesn't matter where the object is here. The rays of light are always going to be bent the same way. So the first one here, if it started out parallel, When it gets bent, again, it's getting bent away. So so it's not like it's going to get bent towards that focal point. It's being bent away. And to figure out the line it gets bent at, it's bent in line with that focal point. So it's almost like you have to trace back to figure out the angle it gets bent at. So in other words, in order to figure out how it's being bent, you follow the rail like that. This second one here is just going straight through. We were trying to draw that third one. The third one would follow that rule from a little while, about a few pages back, that kind of said light that seems to be headed towards that focal point there 
fits bent straight. And again, you do not have to worry about all three of these to figure out where the image is coming from. But this one is headed towards bent focal point, but then it gets bent parallel. Now the question is, or the, the fact is, I should say, if your eye is over here, looking through that lens, these two rays of light, or actually any three of these, never really meet. So it's not like I could take something and project it onto a screen with that type of lens. Because this one doesn't focus light, it spreads it out. Doesn't bring light together, it spreads it out over a bigger area. So what happens is when your eye looks through this, it follows these rays of light. So let's say that light ray and that light ray hit your eye, your eye follows it back through the lens. And where those two rays of light actually met, what is there? So if I follow the blue and the red, where they actually meet, this is where the image would be. And in terms of this image, there's a couple of facts, a uh, couple of important features. First of all, it's virtual, because the rays of light never truly meet. Your eye is trying to make sense of it. Where does it look like they're coming from? It is upright. And the third thing about this, it's a lot smaller. So everything in this lens is going to appear smaller. And it actually appears smaller near the center of the lens than it does further out. So if any of you saw in the last couple of weeks, there was a photo of the Bidens and the Carters, where, and I should have put it in here, but I didn't. Um, actually, why don't I pull it up? Just because we do have some time. So just looking at the proportions in this image, and if you haven't seen this before, uh, I would recommend you look it up on a higher resolution device. But if you just look at on the edges here, how huge the Bidens are compared to the former President Carter and his wife, they are super, super small. So again, the idea here is this was taken with a wide angle lens that could basically capture, they were in a very small room, so they wanted to capture as much as possible. And there's a lot of distortion near the center where the images are appearing much, much smaller than they do on the outside. So this is an aberration based on the lens that they were using to try to capture that whole space. So they were using a uh, diverging lens in order to capture more of the room. And it created that really, really weird image where things were really out of proportion and distorted. So just a modern physics application of that. All right. So again, that's just looking at the images themselves from a um, qualitative perspective. So we'll wrap up just looking at some quantitative. So we're not gonna look at that simulation. We're gonna save that for the virtual people tomorrow. But this formula is the same one we had for mirrors. So it's not a new formula. Relating a couple of factors, like the distance of the object, distance of the image, and the focal point of one. So exact same thing here. The other formula 
same one as before, looking at magnification in terms of heights of the object, heights of the image, and then the distances as well. Again, the one thing to note here is that this is a negative in order to get the magnification. Now, the positives and negatives are what the signs indicate for these are going to be fairly important. So again, try to keep these in mind. When we have the object um, itself, wherever the object is, we'll usually say that's a positive location. So when we place an object, we kind of set that as the positive location. And if something is in front of the lens or the distance, I should say the images on the other side of the lens, that would be considered real. If it's behind the lens, that'd be virtual. Now, these other ones are a little more clear, like upright, it's positive, upside down, it's negative. And then the other thing to remember, a convex lens, because it brings light together, we use that positive focal point. So again, a convex lens brings light together. So we say it has a positive focal point. A diverging lens, since it spreads light out, we're actually tracing it back. So it's considered to have a negative focal point. So this will probably take a little while to get your hands on or get your head on like through your head and kind of like cement it. But we'll work through a couple of problems to kind of apply this. Then I briefly want to talk about eyes for a little bit. Okay, so just to apply this. So we have a clear glass light bulb. So a light bulb is placed this distance. So that's the distance of an object from a convex lens. So remember, a convex lens has a positive focal point. And it wants you to figure out the magnification. So realize for magnification, we need distance of the image and distance of the object. And there's some negative in there. So before we can do that, we have to apply this formula. Find that out first, and then you can find that out. I'll slowly work through it. Feel free to work ahead if you want, if you're feeling good about what you're doing. Or if you just want to follow along, see what I'm doing, that's perfectly fine. So once you subtract those, just remember you have to invert the fraction or invert your decimals. So I got the distance of the image as 1.5 meters. And the reason that makes sense, so this is saying it's a real image. And the reason that makes sense is because this object is behind the focal point. So it's further away because the focal point was 0.5. So it makes sense that you have a real image 
So the next thing to do is to determine the magnification. So this was, I'm sorry, 1.5. And there's a negative in front of it, 1.5 over 0.75. So the reason this is going to be negative, because remember, real images are inverted. So the fact that this is negative means that it's inverted. I got a negative two. So this means it's two times its original size, but it's upside down. So magnification of two means it's two times bigger, but it's upside down. Let's do one more. And then I'll briefly talk about the eye. Let me see which one I want to do. I think I might have. Oh, I just had one more stuff. Okay. Suppose the page of a book is held 7.5 centimeters from a convex lens. So again, this is the distance of the object. And the focal length. Since it's convex, it has a positive focal length. So this is in front of the focal length. So it's close. Really close. So it's just a typical magnifying glass. My hand. So again, you're holding it close, so you're actually magnifying it. So we're trying to figure out the magnification. So again, very similar to the last one. I'll set this up and give you guys some time to actually try to solve this. And find the distance of the image first. And this one's going to be a virtual image. So you should get a negative distance. And a virtual image is always going to be upright. So you should end up with a positive magnification. So your distance to the image should be negative. And the final answer should end up being positive. You're getting a number less than one for your distance of the image. Just make sure you remember to invert your fraction. Or when you do this subtraction here, make sure you do the inverse that. So again, negative 30 over 7.5. And then again, there's a negative there. Ended up getting, I think, four. Yep. Four for the magnification. So a couple of things this says is that it gets four times magnified. But the fact that this is positive tells you that it's upright. So upright is always going to be virtual as well, just if we had a question there. So the last thing to talk about, um, I'm going to go through this simulation. There's some slides after this that you can look at if you want to. Let's kind of walk through this simulation with you. Just talk a little bit about the eye, and then we will be good. So 
nothing like this is on the AP test or anything. So don't worry about that. And you're not going to be tested on this. But I think as a human, it might be good to know a little bit about your eye. If you haven't covered it in anatomy and physiology or something like that. Oops. Bye bye, Biden. So you can play around with this at your heart's content, but um, the basic things we're going to be talking about in terms of the eye are the lens and the retina here. If you want to see all the different parts of the eye, you can turn on this overlay and look at all the different components. But what we're really worried about are the lens and the retina here. So the retina is where light is projected or if light is projected or in focus or where if it's focused on the retina, that's when you see it clearly. And what happens is your lens here has some muscles. So if I turn this on, there's muscles that can stretch and constrict, constrict your lens or change the shape of your lens so that it focuses perfectly. So if something is, if I have an object that, let me move it near to your face, your retina, I should say your lens adjusts so that it tries to focus those rays of light on the back of your eye. So this is a converging lens because it's thicker in the center than it is on the outside. As an object moves further away, the shape of your lens changes in an attempt to focus it on the back of the retina. So if it's not focused there, it's not gonna be clear. It's only if those rays of light meet, that'll be nice and clear. So if you're nearsighted, so if you can only focus on things that are close, you do a great job of focusing at things that are close. But once something gets further away, due to the shape of your lens, if something's far away, you're focusing it too soon. So to correct that, you get a diverging lens. So what that will actually do, it'll spread out the light because you're focusing too soon. So it spreads out the light and allows you to focus at the exact right point. So this is considered a negative prescription. So if you are nearsighted and can't see things far away, you'll usually get a negative prescription either for your contacts or your glasses. Now, on the other hand, if you are farsighted, you have no trouble seeing things that are far away. The issue comes in when things get close. So when you're looking at something close, your, your lens isn't powerful enough to actually get it to focus there. It's focusing somewhere, somewhere back here. So you need some extra focusing power. So what you're given is a positive prescription. or a convex lens. So normally the light would have been heading that way. If you get that extra little bit of bending power to focus that light even before it gets to your eye. So that is what's gonna help for a far side. Now, eventually if you do need bifocals, this will give you an example of that too, if you wanna look at that. So if you need help in both cases, you'll get a lens that has two different shapes. We're on the bottom. On the bottom, it's convex. And up here, it's concave. So when you're looking far away or more straight away, it'll correct that vision. But usually when you're looking at something close, your eyes are usually looking down. So it'll help when things are closer. So, you're not gonna have to remember any of that, but again, you're just kind of wondering about how your prescription relates to it. Essentially, losing lenses to correct our vision is one of the primary reasons we use lenses in the world. And again, one of those things that kind of make us all able to live and thrive where we wouldn't if we were just in nature without, without those advances. All right, so I will end the notes. Tomorrow the lab won't take that long. So if you want to save those problems for tomorrow, please feel free to do that. You just want to relax for the last 20 minutes or so.
Please feel free to do that. But try to do the lab and go come back. You too. Yep, go right here.